Hi everyone, just wanted to show my face before we jump into sharing the screen and feel free if you have any questions, put it in the chat and we'll make sure we get to them later so we can make sure we answer any of those questions there. So I'm gonna stop sharing my video for a moment. I'm gonna share my screen. And can everyone see the main slide here? Kenna, I feel like you'd be the best one to answer that one. Yes, you are okay, good perfect. To go. All right, so as Kenna mentioned, my name is Michaela Blackham and I'm the Accessibility and QA Specialist here at Atten Design Group. And welcome to today's webinar. We'll be going over a non number of items such as why we should be making our social media posts accessible, which platform is actually the most accessible, as well as a number of accessibility guidelines to follow to make your posts more accessible. But before we begin, I just wanna talk a little bit about myself. I started my career in the web industry originally as an interactive designer before I moved into the development world full time a few years ago. And never since I can remember, interaction, ease of use, great organization, as well as accessibility has always been something that's been pretty important to me. I grew up with a cousin my age with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and watched till she was able to do her homework, navigate the internet, or even just listen to music on her iPod all with little to no mobility and difficulty speaking loud enough for talk to type programs like Dragon or Siri. Sometimes she had to get very creative, but most of the time she had to ask for help, which I know frustrated her immensely. And I always wanted to relieve her of that stress. So I slowly got involved with accessibility through the years. Today, I am now a part of a number of accessibility groups around Denver, completed the Web AIM accessibility training in Utah, as well as speak at a number of engagements on the topic. And that brings us to why we're all here today. So let's talk a little bit about social media and accessibility. Kenna, do you mind bringing up the first poll? So how many people here use social media for their organization? Do you tend to use it for everything? Do you use it pretty often, but sometimes you tend to like only do it when you remember or just really if ever? And once we have those answers, we can see what everyone's working with now. And it looks like most people tend to just use it fairly often, but only when they remember or maybe rarely if ever. So hopefully after today, you'll start using it more often to see why it's important to use that. And do you mind bringing up the second poll as well? So if you do use social media, your organization, which one do you tend to use? And if you do have a different one that may not be listed here, feel free to leave it in the comments and we can go over those later on. It looks like most people are actually using LinkedIn, a little bit of Facebook and Twitter. So it'll be fun. We'll be going over all of those ones today. So now that we know where we're all working with, um, let's start with one of the most important questions. Why should we be making our social media posts accessible? And while it's because over 3.9 billion people use social media today as of July, 2020, according to the datareportal.com. And thanks to all the lockdowns this past year, people have been browsing their apps more than ever. I can also tell you that Instagram ads have worked 100% more effectively on myself during this quarantine. From random unneeded shopping to informative articles involving political news to a new dog influencer I should be following. It's gotten a little out of hand and I have no self-control, but I know I'm not the only one. We're all more engaged in social media now more than ever, whether that's for the good or bad. And all organizations should be taking advantage of that. Another great reason is because, well, with that many people using these apps and not just browsing the web like they used to, I can say it's probably the easiest way to get your organization's name out to the masses. For an example, I was supposed to get married in July, and when I was looking for photographers back home, I was on The Knot and all of the different various wedding websites, and I found it was very difficult to actually find, find a photographer that I actually enjoyed, whether it was their pricing or just their personality or even just their work in general. So instead, I ended up going on to Instagram and doing hashtag Cape Cod photographers. 
And with that, I was able to find someone with a style that I loved very easily, was able to negotiate a price that worked for both of us and get that on the book. When I rescheduled, I was able to do the same thing for Colorado photographers and find someone very easily. And not only is it the easiest way to get your name out there, it can also help connect you with your audience and help your audience connect with you. It can increase your brand awareness. It's free or at least practically free, which is pretty amazing in today's world. And again, almost 4 billion people are using social media. Even reaching out to just 1% of that is absolutely incredible. And more importantly, making your post accessible, it just sends a positive message about your values as an organization. And that can truly go a long way. And just like accessible websites, in the end, it actually helps everyone interacting with your organization not just those who rely on assistive technology. So now that you know a little bit about why you should be focusing on the social aspect, the more important question is here as well, which platform is actually the most accessible? Well, there really is what I like to call the big four. So is the most accessible platform Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn? Kenna, do you mind bringing up that poll? Let's see what people are thinking. Which one do you think is the most accessible? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn? So it looks like everyone is expecting it to be Twitter. We have a couple Facebook and a couple LinkedIn. No one thinks Instagram is accessible, so that's kind of fun. This may come to a surprise for all of you, but the most accessible platform is actually none of them. None of them are actually pretty good. They're all actually pretty bad. Each one of them have their pros and cons as a platform, of course, but I would truly never recommend one as the most accessible. But also, even if one was more accessible than another, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will reach out to the largest audience. So this brings up my next big question to explore. Why are all of these platforms so bad? Let's think about this. How many times have you opened up Facebook or Instagram and all of a sudden the UI has completely changed? This happened to me just a few weeks ago on Instagram, for example, where I wanted to take a boomerang. Yes, I know I'm super basic. And I couldn't find the boomy button anywhere. It was super confusing. And this brings up the main reason why the platforms are all so bad. Social media is always updating. These happen without any kind of warning. These could be super small enhancements to even large UI changes. And these tend to happen with little to no testing. And any of the testing that does go through very rarely has any outside users testing those updates. I've even read that Facebook pushes up to five updates a day, up to five. That's absolutely crazy. Yes, most of them are minor, but that's a lot of updates if no one is thoroughly testing them. Another huge reason why it's not that great is because content is all user created. Just like websites, the content on the page tends to be the most inaccessible, not actually the code. It's hard to teach everyone about proper headings, color contrast, use of alternative text. And my biggest pet peeve on social media currently is misspelling absolutely everything. So many people nowadays use social media as a way to rage post fake news. And all my crazy uncles just completely forgot how to spell anything correctly in their rage. But that brings up the point that these aren't all well thought out pieces of content like the content on our websites. It's a way for many users to feel validated, a source of instant gratification, or just to feel engaged. And this includes people who rely on assistive technology. But if all content is difficult for users of assistive tech to comprehend, then we are losing an entire audience. And well, okay, they aren't all that bad. The various platforms have done what they can to make their site or their app as usable as possible as a whole, excluding the user content, of course. For instance, they are giving the opportunity for alternative text now for images, which is a huge win because that wasn't there a few years ago. Another one I've seen a lot is the use of skip links. I know it sounds kind of silly, but all the platforms utilize infinite scrolling. For those that don't know what infinite scrolling is, think of being on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, and you just keep scrolling on the page over and over again and more content is appearing continuously. That's the act of infinite scrolling. There is no end to the page. Without any skip links, 
a keyboard or screen reader user will be trapped within these posts, unable to get back or get out of the site easily because there really is no end to that infinite scroll. Facebook has a great one. This can only be seen when focus is given to it, most likely by a keyboard user. And this is something we can all test out. So it is interesting to see. So if you were on Facebook and you were to press tab one or two times at the very top of the page, you'll actually see this whole section appear. And what it does is it gives you the ability to jump quickly to um, the Facebook footer or to create a post, to jump to the news feed, or maybe just to search Facebook in general. Without this, they would be stuck in the infinite scroll of the feed forever. If they were just trying to get to the Facebook footer, but they're in their feed already, there's no way to truly get out of it. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about each of the platforms because this isn't necessarily something you have control over. So let's more so talk about how you can improve your posts that you're creating. We will start by going over some of the basic do's or don'ts for creating more accessible posts. So social media follows a lot of the same accessibility standards as most other digital formats, such as not writing in all caps. If you were to write in all caps on your posts or on your website, and you're not using CSS to make it appear this way, the screen reader is actually going to read it as D-O-N-O-T-W-R-I-T-E, et cetera. It reads each one letter by letter. That's not a great experience for anyone. And it's difficult for people to read if it's done in um, a full sentence, for instance. Do not write in all caps is already a little difficult for visual users to see. You wanna pay attention to color contrast. And I know this is a little funny to say in social media because you don't have a whole lot of control with that, but I'm seeing this a lot more with like Facebook posts where you can change the background and put a fun gradient on it. But then I'm seeing that people aren't exactly using the right uh, colors on the text and then it becomes a little more difficult to read. So just pay attention to that color contrast. Again, you wanna avoid misspellings. It's difficult and annoying for all of us to read that, including people who are using a screen reader who may have to have that word spelled out individually just because it was misspelled so bad. We also wanna watch out for broken links. There's nothing more annoying for any user out there that clicks on a link that they're excited to maybe go see this dog video, but it's taking you to this 404 page that doesn't work. And for us, we're, I'm confused if I do that, but if a screen reader user is using that, it's also confusing. It's confusing for everyone. So make sure we focus on making sure all your links work correctly. And finally, you wanna make sure you have captions for all of your videos and your stories. And I know that this could be difficult to do, but if you use instances like YouTube, you can actually use their closed captioning, for instance, and then you can make it changes as need be so that it will actually be correct um, transcripts there. Following these, as well as some social media specific guidelines, you can reach out to a much wider audience. So let's talk about some of the more specific social media related guidelines. These include things like how to write your hashtags correctly, the ever so annoying new decorative fonts I see all over Instagram and Twitter, when to use and when to avoid emojis and emoticons, including link shorteners like Bitly, how and where to include alternative text, make sure all of your text is completely readable and not embedded or found in an image, as well as repeating content on all social media platforms. So let's talk about one of the more affiliated aspects of social media, hashtags. These are one of the most important components of social media posts. I like to use them to bring some humor to posts for like friends who are mostly famous dogs, but more social media enthusiasts use them to reach out to a wider audience and to build their brand. It's something we all use or search with, but I bet you never really thought about making these more accessible. But we can go over that today. So there's a few things we need to remember. And one is to always use camel case. We want to include hashtags in your comments. We want to avoid suggested hashtags. So always using camel case. When authoring hashtags that are made up of multiple words, you wanna use initial capitalization, which is also known as the camel case. So if you're looking at this, you can see the A and always, the U and use, the C and camel, the C and case. And what it's doing is it's just visually separating the words. Utilizing this simple technique makes the hashtag easier to read for all users and is more consumable by screen readers since their synthesized voices can recognize and pronounce individual words and won't concatenate and gargle them. So here are some quick examples of some hashtags. 
So as you can see, some of them are kind of long. You are kind of confused on what's going on here. And it's more than just for screen reader users because it's confusing for some of us to use. It's actually going to help sighted users as well. I know when I try to read some hashtags, it's hard for me to even understand what I'm truly reading. And sometimes the string that appears may not exactly be safe for work. What does that last one say? I see something about poop. Get your mind out of the gutter. So now for using camel case, you can see very easily, we have photo of the day, career ending Twitter typos. Oh my God, is that Tom Brady and team Topo opportunities. And also Topo Designs is a great company. I'm so sorry that I used them as the example, but I needed to find something that would kind of work. And I thought that that would be a great one. So if you're in the Denver area, definitely go see them. <laughs> as you can see here, this is for the company Topo Designs and career opportunities, but that's it. <laughs> So now we can go through and talk a little bit about including hashtags in the comments. As you can see here, we have the one hashtag that is a part of the sentence and having it move with the flow is totally fine. So obviously it's who is excited for pound Drupal Con Global, we know we are. But the ones used to tag your content, the ones you see more organizations and influencers adding up to 30 hashtags is putting in the comment section like we did below instead of at the end of the overall description and the caption, which we've all done in the past. The reason why we're trying to get this to be the direction we all go in is because let's think about a screen reader user. If they are looking at this page on Instagram, you're gonna be hearing the alternative text for the image, then you're gonna hear the caption. And then if you have up to 30 hashtags and none of them are camel case, it's going to be a complete mess and crazy to listen to. By separating it into the comments, um, there, it still has that SEO capability there, but it's um, a little bit easier to listen to. And then obviously the screen reader user has the ability to listen to it if they want to, otherwise they can skip to the next image if that's what we're going for. Um, we're seeing that this is becoming more and more commonplace, so let's try to keep that going. And I know this one sounds a little weird by avoiding suggested hashtags, but I promise there's a reason for it. So here's that same picture. You can see in the bottom of the um, bottom of the page there, we are doing a hashtag marketing. We're seeing the suggested hashtags that are appearing. We're having marketing, marketing strategy, marketing digital, marketing tips. And if you remember the first thing I told you not to do or told you to do was to use camel case. And you can see the suggested hashtags are not using camel case. The difference between what's suggested and the camel case one you're going to put in there is just visual. It will still go to that same 17 million posts from marketing digital if you did the capital M and the capital D. It's just visually, that's what we're trying to go for. So by putting more and more of the camel case ones in there, they will start to replace those suggested hashtags. So we just have to make sure that more and more people are using them so that we will all be using that camel case version. And well, Huh, this is a little difficult to read. So let's say this one again. Don't use decorative fonts. This may be one of the more important ones to stay away from currently. The decorative fonts may be a nice new feature for your brand or your profile, but it's officially the most inaccessible part of your post. You wanna know how it sounds? I see this tweet a lot when we talk about decorative fonts. Sometimes it's really great to see an example of how these sound, if it makes any sound at all. Some screen readers will actually just read these fonts as just complete empty air, as nothing, just completely no. But if you do get a noise, this is a great example of why we shouldn't be using them. And I do apologize if you can't hear it during the webinar. However, we will make sure that the link to this will be in the, re, um, the resources as well as in the recording. So let's take a listen to this now. And if you were able to hear that, it was pretty terrible. So imagine listening to that all the time. So try to avoid those and do not use them ever. So we want to also use emoji sparingly and we want to also make sure we avoid emoticons. But wait, you may be asking, what's the difference between an emoji and an emoticon? If you don't know, this is the usual shruggy emoticon. I'm sure a lot of you are also familiar with the table flip as well. And here is that same, I don't know, shruggy in an emoji. The difference between how these read? Well, the emoticon is read as macron backslash underline katakana underline slash macron to a screen reader. 
The emoji, however, is read to a screen reader as shrugging woman. I would basically avoid emoticons altogether. It just gets super confusing, but emojis can be used to create emphasis on items, but maybe only use one or two at a time. It can get extremely confusing when you hear a normal sentence and then all of a sudden you hear a palm on face, shrugging woman with blonde hair, man in business suit levitating. It's a little weird. However, anyone can see how annoying or funny these are to a screen reader user just by asking Siri to read your latest text messages with emojis in it. It can definitely put a smile on your face, but it can also cause major confusion. It can really make sense of why you shouldn't be using so many of them. And remember, never use emojis as alternative text for images. I've actually come across this quite a few times. It doesn't fit alternative text best practices. It can be more of an annoyance than anything else. My favorite example I've ever come across while doing an audit and not expecting alternative text at all was, who star should star be in charge of your birth control decision making? You happy woman with medium skin tone raising one hand, not these other guys, which was completely silly because I had my headphones on, I was in the middle of the office, there were a bunch of people there and then I started laughing out loud and everyone's looking at me. It was a little funny, but obviously it doesn't fit best practices. You, that's not describing the context of the image at all. They were, I don't even know what this was being used for, but it was a little strange. So make sure you never use them as alternative text. This one's another fairly important one. We wanna make sure we use shortened URLs. Not only does it save you characters overall in your tweet or your posts, but it's less burdensome for screen readers to listen to. Normally, as you can see here on the Atten Design website, you would try and use descriptive links. This way a screen reader can easily search the page for links in here, link digital strategy, link user-centered design, link agile process. And for those that don't know, screen readers have the ability to search an entire page by all links on the page, by all buttons on the page, by all lists, by headings, by anything. So this is obviously the preferred way instead of hearing a bunch of learn mores or read more over and over again. And this is especially better than hearing a link that doesn't have any text at all and it's just the overall URL. So otherwise, if that's the case, the screen reader is gonna end up reading HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash at designgroup.com forward slash blog forward slash category forward slash information hyphen architecture, for example. It's a little much. But on social media, you don't have an easy way to change the URL to display a short and readable version. As you can see here, this posts links to the DCCO session information in our shorter link on Twitter. I know this still isn't ideal, but this has less characters for the screen reader to read through. And until we are able to fully clean up these links, this is the preferred way on social media. If you do use a link shortener and can clean it up even more, that's even better. Just remember the shorter, the better. And you hear this all the time for your website and your social media presence really shouldn't be any different. All social media platforms now have the ability to add alternative text to their images. The downfall sometimes is that it isn't very intuitive to find. Other times, you can only do it on desktop and not mobile. This capability has finally been added, but unfortunately, it still has a lot of work to get where it needs to be. But they are at least making strides. Let's take a look at some of the main social media platforms and how to add alternative text. Let's talk about Facebook. The good thing is, Facebook auto-generates alternative text for your photos if you happen to miss them. They're not all, always ideal, but they do a pretty decent job. But obviously it's worth popping in afterwards and cleaning up the suggestions. So let's talk about adding a new post on desktop for Facebook. So here's an example of a Facebook page. So we're gonna go over to the create the post highlighted in yellow over there. And we have the post being created. So now we're gonna choose a photo or video. And here we're gonna choose edit on the photo. And they very easily have the alternative text section right there along with your caption. There's no excuses really. So you can save that and you're good to go. What about if you wanna edit an old post on Facebook on your desktop? We can do that as well. As you can see here, Facebook makes this pretty easy and intuitive on your desktop. You follow the usual dot, dot, dot icon you see very often on social media for their menu. And you can quickly see change all text as an option. So you would click on that and you'd be good to go. So what about if you're creating a new post on mobile? So here's an example of the Atten Facebook on mobile. So we're gonna create a post in the bottom, um, highlighted in the yellow. And here we have a photo that we've already added. And you can see here, 
We next want to go to edit in the top left corner. Sorry, that's the, oh, the three double line, three double dot um, up there. You wanna highlight that for the menu and then we'll go to edit all text. So it's very easy to get to. And next you'll have the little bit of description and then you can add in your alternative text and you're good to go. What about editing an old post on mobile on Facebook? We can do that as well. So here we're gonna do the three dot in the top right corner. And you can see this is a nice photo of Aunt Janice's one year anniversary. And here we're gonna to go to the edit alternative text. And here we'll have that little bit there. And like I said, they have the auto generated alternative text here. So you can see image may contain outdoor text that says Cal one year, happy anniversary Janice. And as mentioned, they do a pretty good job. However, it's probably needs to be cleaned up. It's not ideal to hear image may contain for screen reader. You wanna actually hear what it actually contains. So we wanna override the generated alternative text. And that's where we would override and add the actual alternative text. And then you would save it and you're good to go. So let's talk about adding alternative text to your Instagram posts. Unlike Facebook, no auto generated alternative text gets added to these. I know you were thinking that a lot of visually impaired people don't use Instagram because it, isn't all vis because it is all visual, but that's not true. It's still a great place to pass time, find photographers, like I mentioned before, and even a new hike to do in the area. So let's talk about creating a new post on Instagram for desktop. And well, you actually can't add alternative text to your posts on desktop, unfortunately, for Instagram. So what about editing an old post on the desktop? We couldn't add it for a new post, but ideally we should be able to edit it, right? Nope, unfortunately that fails as well. You cannot change or add any kind of alternative text for Instagram posts on your desktop. So let's talk about doing this on mobile for a new post. This is something we can easily do. So we're gonna add a new post, as you can see, we're highlighted in the bottom in yellow. And here we already included a new image at the top so you can add your um, tag people, add a location, post other accounts. And you're gonna scroll down a little bit more and you'll see advanced settings. And from here, you'll see accessibility and you can write alternative text. And then here is where you can add your alternative text and complete it as done and you can save it and post to the world and you're good to go. What about editing old posts on mobile? So here's an old post that we're gonna look at. So we're gonna go to that three dot icon in the top right that's highlighted. And then we're gonna go to edit once we're there. And then we're gonna go to edit alternative text in the top or the bottom right corner. Unfortunately, Instagram doesn't really pass the contrast check there because what if you have white in that bottom right corner, you're going to miss that. So ideally just remember where that is. However, you do have the ability to add that alternative text if needed. So let's talk about Twitter. Twitter has allowed alternative text for quite some time, but just in, until a year ago, you actually had to go into a setting and then find a hidden spot to even allow that alternative text. The good thing is they've recently made this process a lot easier. So let's talk about creating a new post on desktop for Twitter. And here we're on the Atten profile. So we're gonna create a tweet. And from there, we're gonna choose a photo when we're creating this tweet here. And then you see the photo has appeared. So now we're gonna click the edit button. And then we have the ability to crop or add alternative text. So it's actually pretty easy here. The nice thing about Twitter is that they include a little description, a little bit more than some of the other um, platforms, just so you get an understanding of why you should be doing it. So you can click shore and here's where you would add that alternative text and then you should be good to go. You can save that and your Twitter photo should be good to go. So what about editing an old post on desktop for Twitter? Well, we all know this, you can't edit your post on Twitter. So obviously this fails. So make sure you get it in on your first, um, your first post. So let's talk about um, a new post on mobile for Twitter. So here we've added a new post and we're choosing a photo. So now we're gonna choose the photo that we wanted. Okay, so this is a nice one. You can see highlighted in yellow, we have the alt button. And what's nice about this is that Twitter actually has it so that you can read alt on there, whether it has the black background or a white background because they're paying attention to the color contrast. And next it's that same description. So we're gonna say sure. And then we would end up putting our alternative text in here for the image and you would save and you'd be good to go. And then editing an old post on mobile. Again, we all already know this. It would obviously fail because you can't edit it. So again, make sure you get it in on your first try. So let's talk about LinkedIn. Similar to Facebook, LinkedIn may automatically add alternative text to images that don't have it. 
When uploading an image from a desktop computer, you'll be alerted if alternative text is automatically assigned. You will not be alerted though if you're uploading an image from a mobile device. So just keep that in mind. So let's look at creating a new post on LinkedIn on your desktop. So here we're on the end page. So we're gonna start a new post highlighted in yellow. And then we're gonna to go to the photo option in the left corner. And here we chose this great picture of Ken and we're gonna click on that edit alt text button. And again, they did a great job just like Twitter by creating that contrast. So it will work on a white picture or a black picture. And then here we have that little bit of a description and you can add in your alternative text that you're looking for, save that and you're good to go. So let's also look at editing an old post on desktop. So here's an older post that we have and we're gonna click that three dot icon in the top right corner, highlighted in yellow. And then we're gonna click edit update. And from there, it brings us to that same kind of screen so we can easily add or, or add the alternative text that we need. And then from there, it's the description and we could add in the alternative text that we need, save it and good to go. So what about adding a new post on LinkedIn on mobile? Well, fortunately, we cannot add alternative text on mobile, so make sure you add it on desktop. And so editing an old post, as you can imagine, is going to be the same thing. Unfortunately, we can't do it on mobile. So if you're going to be adding alternative text to your images to LinkedIn, make sure you do it on your desktop. Another thing we should be looking at is to make sure that um, just like our website, you should not be using images that are filled with important text or have text embedded into it. On your site, if you do that, your alternative text would be exactly what the image says. A great example I like to use is just your logo. For instance, ours says at and design group with the little um, sunburst thing there. And all we have to write is at and design group because that's exactly what it says in the logo. You don't include image, you don't include logo because it's being read as image at and design group. Or if you are putting up a poster for a new event, you would most likely link off to it, for example. Um, to the event page with the information that's found, but that wouldn't necessarily work on a shortened social media post for a long description. So this is a post from a few years ago before accessibility was the major focus and after alternative texts and best practices were being pushed on social. So I did wanna show this one because I mean, we need to all learn and grow. So if you're only starting now, that's totally fine. As long as you're making that effort, I mean, we're all learning every day, everything's changing and even the accessibility side, we didn't even have this option a few years ago to add alternative text or maybe the best practices. So here's an example of why it wouldn't, why it's not the best idea. So here we see this beautiful picture of Sally and we see that she's very thankful to be able to get home to be with her family this week. Um, Sally, Director of Project Management. If you look at the caption for this, you can see what are you pound thankful for this pound Thanksgiving. Sorry, I'm saying pound because that's how a screen reader would, would read it. Our Director of Project Management, Sally, and backend developer, David, share what they are giving thanks for this year. It's great. This giving an overview of what those pictures are, but it doesn't actually say what she's thankful for. And if this is what you're coming here for, you're not going to know what it is. So that's why you would need to think about what you're actually putting on the image and what's actually in the caption. Here's a great example of what we do currently. So as you can see, we included some text over the photo. It says, we're hiring UX designer at and.io careers. But if you look at the caption, it's basically reiterating exactly what's on the image. Have you heard the news? We're hiring UX designer, join our team. Head to the link in the bio to learn about the position. So it's encapsulating everything that we're seeing in that image. So it does a great job of what we're trying to get at. And finally, because all platforms are pretty terrible when it comes to accessibility, one of the most important things you should remember when posting to social media is to repeat all of your content. We all have our preferred social media apps, but don't force your content into your preferred app because you're missing out on a large number of people. It sounds annoying, but post it in various forms to all of your social media accounts. Link back to your accessible website with more information regarding this post. Maybe provide daily digests, like an email that includes all of your tweets for the week or the month or so on. Providing multiple points of entry for the same information gives all users the ability to interact with your organization based on their preferred or more accessible platform. So make sure you pay a little more attention to making your posts accessible and posting to various platforms. You will reach out to a much larger audience and everyone will have a much better experience engaging with your organization. Thanks for joining today. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You'll finally be able to see my face and then we can go over any questions that there might be.
Perfect. Thank you so much, Michaela. That was fantastic. Um, and before we jump into the questions, uh, go ahead. If you have anything about accessibility um, or social media and accessibility or anything like that, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Uh, we are up for answering anything. So I'll go ahead and answer, ask that first question here. Someone asked, what if we used other platforms that were not talked about here, like TikTok or Pinterest? So that's a great question. There's some great resources that I've included that we, you will send out after with the recorded webinar that includes reasons why we may want to stay away from some of these things. So obviously TikTok is a fairly new one. I'm not sure how many organizations are on those nowadays. However, it goes along with that video aspect that we just need to make sure that we're using closed captioning or what I'm seeing a lot is people are actually writing everything that's really happening, maybe summarizing a little bit. And that's a great way to go about that. Regarding things like Pinterest or YouTube, um, Pinterest is actually not very accessible in general as a platform. I think it was the lowest rating for any of the platforms. So maybe staying away from that one altogether would be ideal. Um, YouTube, of course, we wanna make sure that we always just include closed captioning or write and um, uploading a transcript for users to be able to download and follow and make sure if you do use closed captioning supplied by um, YouTube, that you're going in and you're just updating that to reflect some words that maybe instead of dog, it was supposed to be God or God instead of dog. And you, it can kind of confuse some of those words that may sound pretty similar. Perfect, that, that was helpful. And I hope that helped answer that question. All right, and if you have any more as, um, as we are talking, feel free to drop them in the Q&A as well. I know sometimes it pops up when we start talking about different things. Um, and then this next question is, what if I use a schedule for my social media posts? Does this have the ability to be accessible? That's a great question. However, I'm not the marketing woman here. So I would love to pass that one along over to Kenna. Yeah, of course. Um, so we specifically here at Atten, we use Buffer. So that one does allow for some accessibility um, in our social media posts, specifically Twitter. Uh, we can add our alt text to images. Um, Instagram, it's a little different and LinkedIn, uh, but Twitter for sure. I know that Hootsuite has just started supporting accessibility in their publisher as well, but I know that it's kind of up in the air with publishers. But a bonus for those who have um, a business Facebook page when you can publish or draft your posts on there, they include um, alt text for their social media and their images as well. So Facebook's a really good one outside of a social media publisher. And I hope that answered that question, if you can think of anything else. <laughs> um, do we have any more questions before we wrap up the webinar today? And feel free if there's any other questions going forward, obviously after we send out the webinar, feel free to um, shoot me an email and we can obviously discuss anything that may come up. Absolutely. So as of right now, no more questions are popping up. So I'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you, Michaela, so much. For